As Roscani mentioned, uh, my name's Anjali and I spent some time working at um, Michael Sabell House until a couple of years ago and it's probably the best job I've ever done so far. So, you know, I would love to come back someday. <laughs> so um, we're going to chat a bit today about nausea and vomiting. Um, I know initially bowels was mentioned on the um, topic list, but I didn't feel I had enough time to cover all of those and give them due justice. So we're going to concentrate on nausea and vomiting today. Okay, so aims and objectives of our session. So the aim is to hopefully increase your knowledge and understanding of assessing and managing nausea, vomiting in palliative care patients. And by the end of the session, hopefully you'll be able to understand some of the pathways involved in nausea and vomiting, considering appropriate assessment and interventions, uh, interventions of patients who have nausea and vomiting, recognize and describe some of the more common patterns that we see and think about the management of some of these common patterns. Um, I'm hoping this session can be as interactive as possible. So please feel free to ask any questions or um, along the way or save them at the end. That'd be great to hear. And we'd love to discuss your cases at the end as well. Okay. So thinking about nausea and vomiting, why do we think it's important that we know about it and know how to management, manage it? Why is it a concern? Does anyone have any ideas? Common symptom. Yep, so it's a really common symptom, absolutely. Anyone else? I think everybody is muted. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, so they are. And it has a big impact on quality of life. Um, someone's always nauseated. Um, also with the ability to take their medications and to keep their medications down. So it can have an impact on other symptoms such as pain. Um, yeah. Absolutely, thank you. Um, has put in the chat box that it can lead very quickly to dehydration and other um, complexities. <laughs> um, that, thank you. I can't seem to see the chat when I'm showing my screen, so thanks for that, Ros, as well. Absolutely. So as you've all said, it's a really common symptom and it can be extremely debilitating and distressing. Um, it can have knock-on effects such as struggling with people taking oral medication can lead to dehydration. So it can have huge knock-on effects. Um, and so studies have shown that it can affect up to 70% of patients with advanced cancer, up to 43% of patients with chronic kidney disease and up to 48% of patients with end-stage heart failure. Apologies for the typo there. So it's not just palliative care patients with cancer, we're looking at it, it's the whole spectrum of them. So it can affect almost anybody. Um, the cause can be multifactorial. So there can be lots of reasons for someone to have nausea and vomiting and a good understanding of the causes are a guide to the best and hopefully most effective treatment. Okay, so thinking about some of the key principles of managing um, nausea and vomiting as symptoms from there. So looking at the options and planning for a treatment based mainly on assessment of the cause of the symptoms. So thinking about why this patient may have nausea and vomiting is really important. Consider any potential reversible factors and managing these or treating these if it's appropriate to do so, depending on the patient. Thinking about both pharmacological, so drug and non-drug management is really important because there are options for both often as well. Um, and thinking about the risks and benefits of any of the treatments that we propose. And these need to be discussed with our patients and it, ultimately what we do needs to involve patient choice thinking about the therapeutic goal that we're aiming for and also the prognosis of our patients. 
really important for any sort of symptom control that we continue to review and reassess symptoms and thinking about a team approach to management. So as with all palliative care symptoms, actually an MDT approach is the most helpful and calling on extra help if you need it is really important too. So when we're thinking about nausea and vomiting, we need to know what we're treating. Can anybody suggest a definition of nausea? What is it? If a patient tells you they feel nauseated, what are they describing to us? It's, I guess it's quite difficult to put into words, but it's sort of a <laughs> feeling of imminent vomiting. They often use words like queasy. Yep. Um, I don't know, you've probably got a better definition. No, absolutely. But that's really good. So we need to understand what our patients are saying. So it is hard to put into words. But I think all of us, when we think about being nauseated, can almost have that sensation, that feeling queasy, that feeling like you're about to vomit. What about vomiting? What's the definition of vomiting? Thank you for that. Expelling of gastric contents, I don't know. Yeah, absolutely, so expelling one's gastric contents, absolutely. So kind of looking at the literature, we've got these, um, these are sort of set definitions of things like nausea and vomiting. So nausea, as was mentioned, an unpleasant sensation of the need to vomit. And often it's accompanied by various autonomic symptoms. So you feel a cold sweat or go pale before when you feel nauseated. Sometimes you can feel increased saliva in the mouth and also tachycardia. So the feeling of your heart racing as well um, is really common. And absolutely definition of vomiting is that forceful ejection of the stomach contents through the mouth. And it's a process where the diaphragm and abdominal muscles contract. The pressure in the abdominal cavity increases and which this compresses the stomach. The stomach, the bottom of the esophagus, the gullet and the pylorus relax and then everything moves upwards, forcing those stomach contents upwards and through the mouth. So those are the most common definitions. But patients will sometimes describe some other symptoms more related to um, these three things. So retching, regurgitation and reflux. So it's important when we take history from our patients that we're understanding the sort of sensations and symptoms that we're having so we can treat them appropriately. So retching is a symptom that usually occurs with nausea and leads to vomiting, but not always. And it's kind of rhythmic spasmodic movements of the diaphragm and the abdominal muscles. Regurgitation and reflux is kind of an effortless expulsion of contents from the gap from the stomach or from the esophagus or the pharynx, the back of the mouth into the mouth from there. So that doesn't have that same sort of retching sensation and that forceful ejection from there. Um, sometimes they can be associated with a burning sensation or pain or even with nausea as well. But it's important that we kind of tease these out. Okay, so why do we vomit? Um, so vomiting is a primitive defense mechanism and it's the body's protective mechanism against an ingested toxin. So body realizes there's something there, decides it's better out than in. So has created this um, sensation of vomiting. Many animals do it. Um, I have a pet cat who thinks it's fun to vomit hairballs all over my floor. So many animals do this and this is why we have this function. Um, Obviously, there are lots of reasons for vomiting and vomiting is mainly control. So a little bit of pathophysiology. I'll try to make this um, as simple as I can, but it kind of helps us understand how we manage and how we treat vomiting if we understand what's causing it. So most of the vomiting is controlled by the vomiting centre, which is in our brain. 
And that kind of triggers us to have this vomiting reflex that we talked about from there. This vomiting center in the brain receives multiple inputs from various places. So it can receive inputs from other parts of the brain, from receptors in our gut, from our vestibular symptoms, so our inner a middle ear, um, and also an area called the CTZ or the chemoreceptor trigger zone, which sits in our brain, partly within the blood brain barrier and partly outside it. So that gets input from all sorts of places from the blood and also from other neurological pathways. There are lots of what we call neurotransmitters involved. So lots of things that this vomiting center reacts to um, and specific drugs may help with specific receptors and neurotransmitters. So trying to put that all into a sort of a bit more pictorial form to make it a little bit more straightforward. So this is the vomiting center that we talked about. So this is the um, processing area which tells the body, right, this vomiting reflex is going to happen and I'm going to vomit now. Um, so it receives these inputs. So lots of things cause vomiting and we'll talk through those in a minute but all of these affect different areas. So the brain, the inner ear, this chemoreceptor trigger zone, um, various um, receptors from the gut, from the neuroendocrine system, and they all lead to this vomiting center. Um, this then causes those sensations. So it causes the brain to feel nauseated. It causes that decrease of appetite it causes those autonomic symptoms that we mentioned earlier, the sort of pulse racing, pale, clamminess, salivation, and finally leads to this vomiting trigger, vomiting being triggered from here. So thinking about nausea and vomiting, you got a sneak peek on the previous slide, but can you suggest some causes of nausea and vomiting that you may have seen in your patients? or that you're aware of? Our medicines. Yep, any particular medicines that you can think of? Oh, lots of them. Opioids, anti-inflammatories, some antibiotics. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, lots yep. of medicines. Great, thank you. Any other causes that anyone can think of? Um, on the chat. Um, yeah. Angeli, people have put hypercalcemia, constipation, yep. infection, okay. and the condition itself, if there's an obstruction. Yeah. Brilliant. Gastric bleeding. Brilliant. Absolutely. Um, and before I go further, I meant to say in the beginning, apologies. I know this is a lunchtime session, so apologies. It's not a very glamorous lunchtime session. <laughs> Great, so lots of things mentioned there. Thank you and for that. And raised intracranial pressure. Yep, absolutely. So as you've all listed, loads of different causes for why our patients may have nausea and vomiting. Um, so these are just some of the ones that you've mentioned commonly from there. So drugs, I've not listed them all, but common ones we see in our palliative care patients are opioids and chemotherapy but often, um, so antibiotics, anti-inflammatory agents as well. So biochemical causes, so hypercalcemia was mentioned and that's something we see a fair amount. So raised urea in patients with renal failure. Um, ketosis. Liver failure can cause nausea and vomiting. So there can be Mechanical causes, so intestinal obstruction and things not moving, therefore coming back up. Or gastric stasis, so, you know, content sitting in the stomach needing to come back up. And actually, constipation can sometimes make patients feel very nauseated and cause vomiting as well. So raised intracranial pressure, cerebellar disease, kind of motion sickness, that positional sickness that we've heard. Pain in itself can cause nausea and vomiting and anxiety or sometimes even anticipation of something that's previously caused nausea and vomiting can be enough to bring on that sensation again. 
So there are a number of different causes. So it's important we root out some of these causes to help us try and manage it most effectively and most appropriately. Okay, and so these are some of the medications that we use. Um, so I think a copy of these slides will be going out to participants, is that right? Yes. For people to have so. Um, but this just talks about going back to the previous overview slide earlier, some of the receptors that common drugs we use work on and where they work. So thinking about what might be causing this vomiting can help lead us to thinking about which are the most appropriate medications that we might want to use as well. Other useful agents that can help sometimes um, include these. So apart from our standard antiemetic medication, the use of steroids can be helpful. Um, erythromycin, so used as an antibiotic, but in this case can help, particularly in patients with things like gastric stasis and as a prokinetic agent, so moving things along the gut. Uh, medications like octreotide to help reduce secretions and antacids can do the same thing. Laxatives, and even looking at things like sedation, relaxation and acupuncture. And all these are good evidence-based methods for um, helping with nausea and vomiting. Some people find, so you'll see in kind of some of the literature and guidelines, suggestions of things like ginger, which some people find helpful, though there's little evidence to back this up. Okay, so thinking about back to our patient with nausea and vomiting, what sort of things do we want to know in their history to help guide our management? Their diagnosis, what drugs they're on, and maybe recent blood tests. Yep, absolutely. So all of those things really important. Anything else? What's worked before? Yep, what's worked before, brilliant. And kind of along with that, what might we want to know as well? What hasn't? Yeah, absolutely. And when bowels last opened? Um... Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Absolutely. So those things are really important. Um, so thinking about, so back to that initial bit, what is actually happening and picking apart what their symptoms are like. When did this vomiting first start? Is it better or worse at any particular times of day? Is it there all the time or does it come and go? What does the vomit look like? Is there lots of it or small amounts? Is there any blood in the vomit? Is there any stool in the vomit? You know, is it a more feculent vomit? How did it start? So what happened to initially trigger it, trigger it off? How has it been treated so far? And actually what hasn't worked? And again, does anything make it any better or any worse? So we kind of need all this information really. Um, also thinking about things like bowels, which I should have put on that slide too. We want to know the relationship with the nausea and vomiting. So is it constant nausea? Do they vomit every time they feel nauseated? We want to think about what medications they're on going back to our causes. Is there anything there which may be worsening their symptoms? We need to examine our patients, so have a look in the mouth, have a look at the pharynx and examine the abdomen. Look in their fundi, so look in the back of their eyes. If you're worried that raised intracranial pressure may be a cause of the vomiting from there and look at their recent blood tests, particularly some of the things that we talked about there. So urea, creatinine, calcium are common ones, common blood tests to look at. And thinking about management. So as we talked about the key principles earlier on, first of all, it's looking at trying to correct the reversible causes as appropriate for our patients. So looking at the things we can manage, um, things like constipation, if there's any biochemical causes like hypercalcemia, looking at actually, is there any anxiety or pain, any medications that we can look at? 
and kind of thinking about non-pharmacological treatment. So are there simple things we can do to help our patients? So actually opening a window, letting in some fresh air can help, particularly if there's smells or malodor that can worsen nausea and vomiting. Do they have good mouth care and good mouth hygiene? If they're not able to drink plenty, their mouths may get dry, that may feel more uncomfortable as well. So important we address those things. What about positioning? So sometimes people feel better sat upright rather than lying down. That can make that sensation a lot worse. So thinking about positioning, thinking about particular smells or foods that may feel particular, especially uncomfortable for patients. And wounds, so kind of ulcers or fungating tumours can often smell quite offensive and that can lead to nausea in patients. And some places may offer acupuncture to aid with nausea and vomiting. Then going on to think about our pharmacological treatments and we'll discuss them a little bit more, some of the common patterns a little bit more shortly. And thinking about with pharmacological treatments, how we treat our patients. So um, really good time to think about parenteral routes with patients. So actually, if they're not able to keep tablets down, why are we continuing to prescribe those? Is it worth changing medication to subcutaneous or um, so syringe drivers or something like that and a parenteral route if that's going to help them for a period? Okay. So looking at some of the common patterns that people have mentioned here, we'll go through. Um, so we'll go through how we manage those. So bowel obstruction, first of all, um, and symptoms that patients have often depend on the level of the obstruction. So patients who where the bowel obstruction is high, so actually they're not able to kind of gastric outlet obstruction or their stomach contents aren't able to move along with um, they often have kind of reduced appetite. They get full very quickly. They may get a lot of regurgitation as well as the sensation of nausea and vomiting and often have large volume of vomits. And sometimes patients describe that the nausea is relieved very quickly once they've had a vomit and release those gastric contents. And patients with gastric stasis, so where stomach contents don't move very quickly, often complain of very similar symptoms. Um, any obstructions in the small bowel, they may have vomits that contain undigested or partially digested foods. And again, these may well be of a large volume. Large bowel obstruction um, can be less frequent vomiting, but these are often feculate in nature. So patients have offensive stool-like vomits and can be very distressing for them. Um, obstruction can be mechanical, so there can be a physical blockage in the gut, such as a tumour, for example, or there can be sort of more functional elements due to um, metabolic derangements or previous adhesions or scarring. And it may be complete, so absolutely nothing going through, or a partial obstruction where some things are going through from there. So how do we manage it? And again, it's thinking about those same principles. So looking at possible reversible causes. So is a degree of this caused by constipation? In which case, thinking about managing that with appropriate laxatives or thinking about suppositories or enemas. Is there a surgical cause? And if so, is surgery appropriate for our patient? given their history, prognosis, and patient choice as well. A degree of bowel rest may be helpful, so reducing or stopping oral intake, but making sure that we um, make sure our patients are well hydrated again, if appropriate. And thinking about an NG tube, which kind of works by decompressing and draining the stomach contents to help with that sensation of nausea or vomiting. And moving on then to our kind of pharmacological measures. So if there's a partial obstruction, i.e. some things are moving through, we can use what we call a prokinetic agent. So something like metoclopramide, 
which helps move gastric contents along. However, it's really important that we don't use this if there's a complete obstruction. So when there's a complete obstruction, we think about some of the other medications that work on other, for example, global receptors. And common ones we use would be levomepromazine, cyclozine, or haloperidol, and often via a parenteral route. So hyacin butyl bromide can also be used as an adjunct, so buscopan to help reduce spasm and help reduce some bowel secretions. Steroids may be used to help reduce edema and octreotide again to reduce um, secretions from the bowel and all of these can help with the nausea and vomiting from bowel obstruction. Moving on to the next one, so chemical and metabolic. So this is things like hypercalcemia. Um, so often patients have a constant sensation of nausea. The vomiting may be variable and less than with something like a bowel obstructive picture, um, but that nausea is more longer lasting, can be triggered by smells, and it occurs often from the stimulation of that chemoreceptor trigger zone. So certain receptors that affect. And this is the same sort of nausea and vomiting that people um, often get with morning sickness type nausea and vomiting too. So a constant sense of nausea. So how do we manage this one? So back to looking at our reversible causes first of all. So are there any biochemical abnormalities, looking at medications? looking at is it chemotherapy that's causing it and how we can amend any of these things to help our patients and then thinking about the appropriate pharmacological measures we can use. So haloperidol and metoclopramide can be helpful and also ondansetron for the more chemical and metabolic nausea and vomiting. Okay. So patients with raised intracranial pressure find their symptoms are worse in the morning, so often worse when they wake up in the morning. They have a constant headache to go with that nausea and vomiting. So looking at kind of pharmacological measures here, cyclozine, um, because often it's those histamine and um, ACH receptors. So cyclozines are good antiemetic to try and use here. Steroids can sometimes be helpful to help with the mass effect of anything within the brain and also considering options like radiotherapy and neurosurgery if they're appropriate to for our patients. So one of the things we often see is patients who have multiple potential causes of nausea and vomiting, or actually, despite our good history taking and assessment, there's an unknown cause and we don't really know why they're getting it. So in this case, levomopromazine can be useful as a broad spectrum antiemetic medication, and looking at our pharmacological methods as well. So when we're prescribing these, it's important that we are aware of some cautions with these medications. So particularly levomopromazine, metoclopramide and haloperidol can all cause what we call extra pyramidal side effects. So patients can get almost a Parkinson's like picture. They can get tremors, get rigidity, get slow movements or have something called tardive dyskinesia, which some of you may have seen, which is sort of a smacking movement um, of the lips. Sorry, I thought I'd put in a video, but I hadn't done so from there. So looking for those side effects. Also to be aware, there are MRHR warnings about the use of metoclopramide and domperidone, particularly with longer term use. So it's thinking, weighing up the risks and benefits of these. And metoclopramide can also cause something called an oculogyric crisis, more commonly in younger women, but something else for us to be aware of. So that's a real, sorry, quick whistle stop tour of assessment and management of nausea and vomiting for our palliative care patients. Um, I do have a hypothetical case study that we can use to talk through, but I wondered if anybody had any particular cases they wish to discuss. 
instead as an alternative. Um, Angela, I think your case would be fine. I've got a few um, comments or tips mm -hmm. that I could add. Um, that would but be let's brilliant. Wait till, shall I do that now? Great. Okay. So one of the things, um, I visited a Scandinavian hospice some years ago, and they used crushed ice for all of their patients with nausea. And it does block, I think, the vagal messages. Okay. Um, you know, when people faint and have a, um, a vasovagal attack, people often feel sick when they come round from a faint and you can block those nausea messages. So um, all hospices in Scandinavia have ice machines. Um, and a lot of patients actually like, if your teeth are okay, having a uh, trying ice. Um, mm -hmm. I was also thinking that we need, um, I've thought for years, we need an anti-emetic patch I think there is a granizitron patch, but I think it's incredibly expensive and I've never seen it used. Um, but out in the community, um, people use Buckerstem, yep. um, which is a buckle tablet. So if you can't swallow or feel sick when you swallow, Buckerstem can help. Although a lady came into the hospice yesterday completely sedated on Stematil, prochlorperazine, five milligrams, three times a day. An older lady in um, very dry, in probably in advanced renal failure, where the Stematil had completely sedated her. Yeah. Um, um, I've seen kind of that with some patients that I've given Stematil to. They find it makes them incredibly drowsy, but also a few patients have said the they take such a long time to dissolve that in itself, having it there makes them feel nauseated too. So it's Yes, so I was just thinking about patches and yeah, ice. And patch the brilliant. Cover before we finish, but let's do your case. Um, is doses of cyclozine because guidance is changing now. Okay. Okay, so I'll let you carry on. Okay, that that'd be useful for me too. Thank you. Okay. So thinking about a case here, so we've got Fatima, who's a fifty-nine-year-old lady. She's got advanced ovarian cancer with moderate ascites and complaining of nausea and vomiting. She also has a mild generalized abdominal pain and you're asked to review her at home because of her symptoms. What else might you want to know from her history? What else might people want to ask? Or I know we touched on some of these with the previous. Um, sort of her last time she'd been to the toilet, have any problems with constipation? Yeah. What patients she may be on already? Mm -hmm. um, has she been having any treatment recently, which may be causing the nausea? Fantastic. The breathlessness because of the acidis, pressure effect. Yeah, absolutely. So is there a pressure effect as well? Great. Okay. Any other thoughts? What else might we want to know about her? Is it new, uh, nausea and vomiting? Yeah, absolutely. New. So has she had it for a while or is this new one set? Um, Great. Brilliant. So she tells you her bowels last opened about five days ago but she is passing flatus. That kind of generalized pain, it's not colicky in nature. And when she vomits, it's partially digested food stuff and fluid mainly. There isn't any blood that she's noticed in her vomit. But for about the past 48 hours, she's been unable to keep her medication down. And the only medication she'd been on previously is, um, grams twice a day with some PRN oxycodone, but she's not managing to keep these down now. She's been given PRN antiemetics, um, cyclozine, metoclopramide and ondansetron, but these have all been given to her orally and she hasn't found any of them particularly helpful at this stage. So are there any other further assessments or examinations you might want to do for Fatima and how might you help manage her symptoms with that history we have so far? Uh, 
Um, somebody on the chat has put in um, doing the bloods. Yep. Absolutely. So blood tests would be really useful. A physical examination of the stomach. Absolutely. What might be we what what might we be looking for there? Bowel sounds. Yep. Ascites. How much ascites is there? Yep. Absolutely. Um, yeah. If there's anything in the bowel. Yep. Okay. Um, and how might we manage the symptoms? What are some things we might look at? Um, yeah, carry on. Um, if she needs antiemetics, how are they? Is her PRN oral? But if she's not keeping any oral down, um, you know, how are we going to deliver the antiemetics and the pain, and the pain uh, medication as well? Because they're they all seem to be oral which could be contributing to the pain, to the nausea and vomiting if she's in pain. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So lots of things we might be able to do here. So abdominal exam, um, as people have mentioned, is she in partial or complete obstruction from the history? It sounded like partial obstruction. Does she have bowel sounds? Do we need an abdominal x-ray for further information? And is that appropriate? Um, but an NG tube might be useful. Mouth care would be helpful and going with Ros's suggestion, actually crushed ice might be a nice thing for her too. And really important is people who've picked up on thinking about alternative medications and the root of medication. So she's not, so the only antiemetics have been oral and she's only been having oral painkillers, which she's not able to keep down. So is some of this nausea worse than worsened by the degree of pain she's in. So thinking about actually a syringe driver and possible subcutaneous PRN medications. And, and that would um, yep. in the chat, I think Barbara highlighted, there are melt versions of drugs like Ondansetron and Olanzapine, which some people are using a bit more for nausea. So the melt versions might get absorbed um, even if somebody is vomits. Yes. That's a really good point. Thank you. That, that's not actually something that I often think of or remember early enough. So that's a reminder for me too. Thanks, Barbara. Great. So absolutely. So this patient may benefit from something like the melts um, for at least the antiemetics there before thinking about alternative routes from there. Um, she's not had her bowel op bowels open for five days. So do we need to think about constipation? and thinking about any other anticipatory medications. And actually, if things aren't settling or we're concerned, really important, back to our MDT approach, you know, getting specialist advice as other more specialist medication um, appropriate for her. So that's just a, just a brief kind of case study about making sure we look at all those points with assessments and working out what's important and how we manage our patients from there. Um, these are just some of the references used for this. 